So, welcome back to this week's review of Shogun. And now we're on episode 9 titled Crimson Sky. And like always, this video will discuss lots of spoilers. So, the first thing I gotta say about this episode is the title is so deceptive that it would probably make Lord Toranaga proud. Step 1. Spend several episodes hyping Crimson Sky. This is the battle plan for an all-out arrows, guns, cannons blazing assault on Osaka Castle. Step 2 is having Crimson Sky as the title for the second to last of your 10 episode miniseries. And this is when both you and the audience know that the final episode is just where massive battles tend to happen. Especially in bloody period piece dramas. But step 3 is... Don't have a battle. I didn't see that one coming. So basically, titling this episode Crimson Sky was a bit of a bait and switch. But that's not to say that nothing happened in this episode, because actually a lot did. And we even lost another major character. In fact, it seems like every episode you have to lose at least one. So the episode itself opens with a flashback, and it shows a young Lady Mariko, and it's after her entire family's death, so it's not her happiest moment. And we see that the only person to comfort her at this time was Father Alvito, and this kind of explains why she converted to Catholicism. And it makes sense because in Japanese culture, her name at this point was Forever Tainted, and she has no chance of any redemption. But Christianity is the opposite. She's allowed to be born again. And we even got a nice little prayer ceremony with her and Father Alvito. And this becomes especially relevant later on, and it plays again at the credits, and you'll see why. And I, I thought that was a nice touch. And this is more personal, but... What I like the most about this adaptation is that it skips most of the Portuguese drama. And because of that, it doesn't have any of the anti-Christian messaging that the 1980 series and novel had. You will be scourged. And I still could eat those words next episode, watch it just be focused on that, but I gotta give the show credit for not going down that route. And in my opinion too, just the whole drama with the Portuguese and John was definitely the weakest element of this story. Who don't have that power? I was always just more interested in the Japanese and samurai drama. And for me, that was always the most exciting part of the story. The other stuff didn't really do much for me. And just the fact that it's almost non-existent in this adaptation, that's going to end up being a big positive for me when I do the full review for the series. And I always point to how cheesy the 1980 series is, but the Christians in that, they act like cartoon villains. It's really bad, and kind of funny, but still. I'm definitely glad they didn't have that this time around. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my underground lair. Anyway, in this episode, we get both Mariko, Yabu, and John. And they're already in Osaka. In fact, it just begins with them already in the Council of Regents. And I just gotta say that Yabu Shige was the best character in this show. Oh. I just loved watching him. He was great in every episode. And especially in this episode, how we just watch him constantly switching sides. But I noticed that it's never really to benefit him, it's more so just to ensure his survival. And it's kind of unfortunate that he got caught in between these two very powerful men. And I also can't believe that he actually pulled off the oh wow what's over there before stabbing the guy to death, it's the oldest trick in the book. 
Runner-up is when you bow, and then when the other guy bows back, you then stab him in the neck. Yabushige just knows all the good moves. But I like too in this how Yabu and John were kind of getting along. Yabu just teaching John how to bow correctly, and just them just sitting together. It's just such great stuff, and I'm kind of sad that their buddy error is only gonna last till next week. They should really just do a buddy cop drama with the two of them, that would be great. But this episode is really about Mariko, and it soon becomes clear that they're on a very specific mission. She's really working behind the scenes with Turanaga, and by appearing before the council, this places Ishido in a bad position. If he refuses to allow Mariko and the ladies to leave, then he's showing to the nation that all the nobles and their families gathered in Osaka aren't really his guests. Instead, they're his hostages. As long as he holds so many lords and ladies, no one in Japan, even including Turanaga, can rise against him. And both Ishido and Oshiba know that it looks bad to stop Mariko from leaving. They also know that she's right. That she and all the other nobles are really hostages. Hostages that they actually badly need. Letting Mariko and everyone go will pretty much open the floodgates for everyone else. And she states that she must obey her lord's orders, Toranaga's. And first she uses her samurai to fight Ishido's guards. They're blocking her. And this is probably my favorite combat scene in the show so far. They pronounce their intent, they cleanly kill them, and then they smoothly just put their swords back into their sheaths. It's in true samurai fashion. And all the samurai just kill each other in this quick but awesome and bloody battle. It was very well shot. And then we get the scene with Mariko with the Naganada, and she's taking on a group of spearmen. And we already saw this in the trailer, in fact it was months ago at this point, and it's very Hollywood-like. I thought it was just gonna go full Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, just seeing her do flips and stuff, fighting everyone. But luckily they didn't just have her kill everyone, that would have been cheesy. Instead she swings at the soldiers, and we see that they're not permitted to let her pass, but they also can't kill her. And with the scene she's made to look all brave and strong, you know, taking on multiple men at once. But really if they had the orders, they would have killed her in a second. And after this demonstration, she declares that because she can't follow her lord's orders, she now wants to commit seppuku. But because she's Catholic, she can't take her life herself. She'll need a second. That way, technically, she wouldn't be committing suicide. And actually, John volunteers to do it. And this was supposed to be a romantic scene, but what I was thinking the whole time is that John doesn't really know how to use a katana. He's not a skilled swordsman. Now I'm picking up the sword calmly. And you definitely want a skilled second because it might actually take them a few tries to actually put you out of your misery. And I just picture a scene with John hitting Mariko with a sword and just continuously missing her neck. That would be pretty memorable. But what the show is implying is that John, by volunteering to be her second, this shows a contrast to her husband, Buntaro, who refuses to let her die. And this must have worked because later on, Mariko actually sleeps with John. And last week, people brought up a pretty interesting point. And I criticized how bipolar the relationship of John and Mariko was. But if you look at it, the first night that they slept together, 
This was because they thought that her husband, Butero, was dead. So technically, Mariko didn't commit adultery. And then when Butero came back, she was then standoffish to John. But now it seems like because she knows she's gonna die, it doesn't really matter anymore. And the show actually skipped this, but in the books, the both of them got real touchy on their way to Osaka. They have some three ways, sex toys, and it's just an open secret with all the women in their entourage. But they really gutted all that in the show. And I gotta say, some of that is probably for the best. But the hot and cold treatment that John gets from Mariko in this adaptation definitely is a little bipolar. And I feel that the show kind of did a bad job at just conveying their relationship. They make it seem like she's just having moments of weakness. But in the novel, she's committed to the point that she actually risks everything to be with him. Anyway, of course, the both of them are spared their love suicide, though I would have loved to have seen that. And this is when Ishido just bursts in and he stops the ritual. He throws a permit at Mariko, and this will allow her and the other ladies to leave as requested. And it seems that her act of protest worked. Unfortunately, the very shifty Lord Yabushige He's been doing some maneuvering of his own in Osaka. And Ishido has given him one last chance to prove his work. Yabushige turns on his own men, he kills several guards, and he allows a force of shinobi ninjas into the palace. And these highly trained mercenaries have been sent by Ishido to infiltrate the hostages' quarters and stop the escape by any means necessary. And I gotta say, this is a pretty exciting scene. You know, what would a samurai show be without some ninjas? Unfortunately, ninjas have been ruined for me by YouTubers. Apparently, they never really existed. At least not the pajama-wearing ones that we've grown to love. They were more so just assassins. They could be anyone wearing normal clothes. I don't think there's actually any evidence of them ever wearing the ninja clothing that we always see. But ignoring the historical inaccuracies, I did still enjoy seeing John use his pistols to fight some ninjas. And he's doing some John Wick type stuff, except it's with a flintlock. And not only just using pistols, but just some pretty badass tactics. And people were always asking why he was so pathetic in combat. And the answer is that when you have pistols and cannons, you don't really need much else. And actually in the novel, John was supposed to be pretty deadly with daggers and knives as well. Anyway, I just loved it. I love the explosive effect of the old pistols. Also, just him blowing into the barrel, you know, to put out some of the burning embers. That was pretty good attention to detail. But while this ambush is going on, Moriko is able to dodge their attempt to capture her, and she gets away. And with her, John, the other ladies, and even Yabushige, of course he's just pretending to be surprised by all this. He really is a hilarious character. But the group eventually hides in a storage room, and it has a heavy door. And if you know the story, as soon as you see that door, you know, you know what's gonna happen. And we could just hear the enemy just plotting to blow them up. And then, Mariko makes her last stance. She uses her own body to blunt the explosion. She presses her back against the door, and she begins one final speech of protest against Ishida. But this time, she uses her maiden name of Akechi. And she does it 
in her father's honor. And the last thing we see before the flames is her face coming straight at us. It's a fitting end to an episode that centered on Mariko. So I just want to say that I always hated the way she died. Death by having pajama wearing ninjas shoot a flaming metal door at you. You know, how do you make this stuff up? And it was especially awkward in the 1980s series. You just see this big door crush her. But in this version, it just seemed very Hollywood. You know, she finishes her entire speech right before the explosion goes off. You know, we've seen that a million times. Anyway, I know some of you might be upset with this. You know, it was a sad death. So I'll just say that she died honorably. So no, episode 9 does not have a battle for the future of Japan. Or at least it wasn't the kind we've been conditioned to expect. And there wasn't even a Turanaga in this. But you could say that everything that happened in Osaka was him really pulling the strings. Seems like everyone else, especially Ishido, is just playing checkers. Where Turanaga is playing some multi-level chess. And I have a lot of questions about what's gonna happen next. It's only one more episode. Will my best friend Yabushige be found out and killed? I really hope not because I like him, he's great. And will Marco's death now cause Ishido to lose Lady Oshiba and the other regents? Is he gonna lose all their support? And maybe that's how Turanaga is able to win. And are we gonna see the Battle of Sekigahara? If you've read the novel then you know that's a big part of this story. I guess we'll just find out next week. Anyway, let me know what you thought of this episode. Did Mariko's death really upset you? Or did you not really care? Anyway, let me know and thanks for watching.